Hi, everyone. This is Rick Cole, and you are listening to the 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast. Each week, we take you on a trip down memory lane back 50 years where we report on all the hockey news of that time. In this episode, we're looking at the week of February 1st to February 7th, 1971. This podcast is made possible by the support of our two sponsors, newspapers.com. They're the world's largest online newspaper archive, and they enable us to go back in time and get all the great news tidbits that we pass along in each episode. And the Breakwall Brewing Company have been great help to us as well. They're located in beautiful downtown Port Colborne, Ontario, just steps from the Welland Canal and Lake Erie. They provide some of the best craft beers and southern Ontario and as far as I'm concerned some of the greatest pub food on the planet. When things get back to being open up again I'd love to meet any of our listeners for a beer and a burger at the break wall. If you if you like what we do on this podcast every week and uh, on Twitter every day for that matter you can help us out by going to patreon.com slash hockey 50 years to subscribe to the special uh, content broadcasts that we put out several times a month. Uh, These subscriptions, and thanks to everybody who has signed up already, enable us to keep the lights on here and to uh, get as much great content as we can. Uh, Subscribers not only get early access to these podcasts each week, uh, but we have some really neat stuff in special episodes where we delve more deeply and in greater detail uh, that we can do in in the weekly podcasts where... uh, Uh, One of our really fun segments uh, in a recent bonus episode was uh, where we looked at the uh, Buffalo Sabres and how they dealt with a four games and five night stretch. And it was all from the perspective of general manager coach Punch Imlach. And he really gave us some interesting stuff that you really wouldn't get anywhere else. We also have a special project we're working on to cover the Ned Harkness era in Detroit and how the media treated the death of Terry Sacha. We think a $5 a month subscription is well worth your investment if you have any inve- uh, interest in hockey history or just in the 1970s at all. My dad always told me, you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been. Last week, we had a few interesting stories for you. The deadline that Al and Eagleson set for trading uh, for the Maple Leafs to trade Mike Walton came and went without a deal that would move the troubled young center to another NHL team, but nothing really happened over it. The Canadians finally traded Ralph Backstrom in a deal that, as we illustrated, truly demonstrated how Machiavellian Sam Pollock could be in his dealings with other NHL teams. And a future National Hockey League and present National Hockey League general manager made his professional hockey debut as a player as David Poyle was given a five-game pro tryout by the American Hockey League Rochester Americans. This first week of February 1971 will mark a little bit of a departure from our usual weekly format, and that's because this week will probably forever be known as Trade Week in the NHL. And that's what we'll be reporting on exclusive, well, almost exclusively in in this episode. Uh, these are the stories that caught our attention this week. Mike Walton was finally traded by the Maple Leafs in a deal that should have cemented a very bright future for the Toronto franchise. But would it? Only time would tell. That wasn't the only big trade of this week. Uh, there was yet another Detroit Red Wings New York Rangers swap. And we have the details on that. And then the week ended with yet another blockbuster deal, again involving the Red Wings, this time with the St. Louis Blues. And we have all the details on that one in which superstars actually were moved between the two clubs. So as I said, we're changing things up this week. We just won't have time for any game summaries, but we will get back to them in future episodes. That's for sure. There's just too much of the trade news that dominated dominated the uh, the landscape in the NHL in this first week of February. 
Uh, we promised to report this week on how gambling was a, a real threat to the NHL. But with all the trade news, we'll uh, probably move that in advance to one of our special content episodes that our subscribers will be happy to get. So the week began with a bang, that long-awaited trade of Mike Walton from the Toronto Maple Leafs to, well, just about anywhere, according to the speculation, finally came to pass, and it was a doozy of a deal. Walton, who as everyone knew by now, wanted badly to be moved to Toronto, and he was on the move. Was he ever on the move, as you find out exactly what took place? Everything came together on a Sunday evening, but it wasn't widely reported until Monday morning. Toronto and Philadelphia kicked things off by uh, agreeing on what would end up being a three-team trade, ultimately. Walton moved from the Leafs to Philadelphia and then to Boston in a shocking set of transactions whose seeds were actually planted days earlier uh, by another trend, uh, trade that was largely overlooked by the media and hockey fans in general. The first part of all this bartering involved getting Walton out of Toronto into Philadelphia. After weeks of haranguing between the two clubs, the Maple Leafs finally agreed to send Walton and goalie Bruce Gamble, a loyal employee who had been with the team for over four years, to the Flyers. Now, the Leafs also included their first round draft pick in the 1971 amateur draft, something Stafford Smythe had said under no circumstances the team would give up. But in exchange for, for, uh, those assets the Flyers sent to the Leafs star goaltender Bernie Perron agreed upon by many to be the best young netminder in the entire National Hockey League and the Leafs also got the Flyers second round choice in that 1971 draft. So as the news kind of came out on Sunday, it seemed reasonable enough for the Flyers to make a deal like this because they have been an offensively starved uh, franchise since their inception in 1967. But strangely enough, Philadelphia had absolutely no intention of keeping Walton with that team. As we mentioned, the seeds of the next deal that took place had actually been planted days, probably weeks ago, uh, when they sent the, uh, when they would send Walton on to Boston. A few days earlier, the Flyers had agreed to acquire a young forward by the name of Danny Schock, younger brother of the uh, Blues Ron Schock, from the, uh, from the Bruins for those always included future considerations. And here we were about to find out just what those in future considerations would consist of. Well, it turned out that Walton was the property of the Philadelphia Flyers for less than 30 minutes as he was moved on to the Bruins, who had been trying to convince the Maple Leafs to trade uh, Mike to their team. Leafs didn't want to trade him within the division, of course, and have him forever haunting them with uh, f uh, goals against them. So they sent him to the Western Division Flyers instead. From the Bruins, the Flyers would receive young forward Rick McLeish, who was the fourth overall draft pick in the 1970 amateur draft, after Gilbert Perrault, Dale Talon, and Reggie Leach. McLeish, who at that time was playing for the Oklahoma City Blazers of the Central League, and that was what it looked like, McLeish for Walton even up. But of course, there was more, as we mentioned. The Flyers owed the Bruins those future considerations that they had promised in the acquisition of Ronnie Schock, and that part of the deal was actually canceled with Walton going to Boston. So the trade boiled down to Walton for Rick McLeish and Danny Schock, and the Flyers thought they made out very well in getting futures for the present when they actually gave up Bernie Pratt. So let's look at how this trade was reported, first through the eyes of Red Burnett, the veteran hockey writer of the Toronto Star. Maple Leaf solved two major problems with one stroke of business when they acquired Bernie Prawn of the Philadelphia Flyers, rated by most experts as the best young netminder in the National Hockey League, to strengthen a vulnerable position 
on the Maple Leafs, and they unloaded Mike Walton, a talented but unhappy center, in the process. Walton didn't even get to say hello to the folks in Philly. He was shipped immediately to the Boston Bruins for Rick McLeish. He's a former junior whiz, now with Oklahoma City of the Central League, and Danny Schock, rugged center who went to Philadelphia from Boston earlier for future considerations. Bruins general manager Milt Schmidt called Walton to give him the welcome news Sunday night. It had been no secret that Mike had wanted to join his business partner, Bobby Orr, with the Big Bad Bruins. Walton will see his doctor Monday afternoon before leaving for Beantown, and he also has a press conference scheduled as well. He says he always wanted to go to Boston, but figured there was no chance since Toronto had apparently rejected an offer from the Bruins of Garnet Bailey and Don Marcotte for Walton services. The Leafs insist they were never offered Marcotte and Bailey as a package, but they are as happy as Walton over the sudden turn of events. Uh, Leafs Vice President King Clancy said Perrant could solve our goaltending problems for 10 years. We've been trying to get him for several years. He's a good size, stands up, plays the angles well, and he'll learn a lot here from Jacques Plante, the best goalkeeper in the world, and of course, from our great Johnny Bauer. Now, I personally can tell you this. I had a conversation with Jim Gregory at once one time about this very trade, and he told me that he first got on to Perrant's game when Bernie was playing for the Niagara Falls Flyers in the Ontario Hockey Association Junior A Series, and Jim was coaching and managing the Toronto Marlies. Jim, ever since that time, had been trying in different uh, ways to influence the Leafs to somehow get Perrant from the Boston Bruins. Uh, they, uh, he said they should try to trade. Uh, it, and when he was unprotected in the amateur draft, Jim had suggested to the Leafs, at that time general manager, whom he would later succeed, Punch Imlac, to try and get Perrant for the Maple Leafs, but they never were able to do it. When Jim finally had a chance as the general manager of the Leafs, he did what he could and he got Perrant. He had been trying to dicker for Perrant with Philadelphia ever since he took on the role of GM of the Leafs and he told me it was finally a case of the Flyers figured they had to plan for the future and trading Walton for McLeish was a big part of that deal according to Jim. Red Burnett reports that Philadelphia general manager Keith Allen admitted he hated to part with Perron as number one goalie, but he felt he had to give up that man the Leafs wanted in order to get the young hockey players and the draft pick, that first round pick that Philadelphia needs to build a Stanley Cup contender for the future. Allen said, at least he told Burnett, there was never any thought that Walton would be kept by the Flyers. Allen told Burnett from the outset, we were dealing with Boston and Toronto at the same time. They, could, they couldn't get together on a deal, so we became the middleman. The Bruins wanted Walton, we wanted youth, and now I think everyone is happy. Allen went on to explain that he hates to let a fine talent like Perrant go, but that Perrant was the man the Leafs insisted on and they sweetened the pot enough to make it worth Philadelphia's while. The Leafs uh, sweetened that pot. They had offered Walton and Gamble for Perrant. Flyers wouldn't do it. When the Leafs included their first round draft pick in 1971, that was the piece that convinced Allen the deal would all be worth it. As for Bruce Gamble, you'd think he would be uh, really happy to get out of Toronto being the uh, second fiddle to Jacques Plante, but, but that really wasn't the case. Gamble told Burnett, I like it here. Uh, John, the coach McClellan, was great to play for. The team is gelled and we're a happy outfit right now. You know, like the man who came to dinner. I came to Toronto for two weeks and I stayed for five years. Bruce said he has three boys in school and he's going to keep his home in Toronto until the lease on it runs out, which will be in June. Now the first thing Gamble did when he got the word was to check the Western Division standings and he says the Flyers are doing well, two, two wins over the weekend. He says he thinks he'll be happy in Philadelphia. Uh, 
Bruce was asked about the uh, harsh criticism that President Stafford Smythe had levied on him for most of the season. Uh, Bruce get passed it off as a minor irritant. Gregory said he hated to give up the Leafs' number one overage junior draft choice to the Flyers, but that was the only way he could make a deal for Walton, which would actually help the Maple Leafs. We talked to all but two or three clubs in the league, and this was the best deal possible. It means we give up the ninth or 10th junior grad, but we get the 22nd or 23rd in return. And as you know... Gregory says, juniors are an unknown quantity in Perrant. We got extreme quality. I regard him as the finest young goaltender in hockey. Most reports said that they couldn't get a hold of Philadelphia's uh, Perrant to uh, get his comments on the deal. But Red Burnett uh, tells us that he actually did get through to Bernie. And here was their conversation. He asked Bernie how he felt about being played uh, traded to Toronto. And Perrant's response was, Great, great. I expect to be with the Leafs for a long time. It's a good deal for me. I've always liked Toronto. I know Jim, that's the Leafs general manager, Jim Gregory, and Johnny McClellan, the coach, from working with them at the Halliburton Hockey Haven in the summers. They're wonderful people. Perrant told Burnett that he's already talked with Jim Gregory and that Gregory has arranged for a house for him and that'll make it a little easier for Bernie and his wife and their kids to move from Philadelphia to Toronto. Uh, they, Bernie said he'd been in Philadelphia for four years and they made a lot of good friends, but he's really looking forward to playing for the Maple Leafs. Ber Bernie said that Jim Gregory had actually wanted him to come to Toronto right on Sunday night, but Bernie asked him if he could have a day or two to, to make it up uh, to Toronto because he wanted to drive there with his family rather than leave them behind in Philadelphia and Gregory was all for that he understood the upheaval that a player goes through when he's traded from one city to another. Pratt uh, finished off his conversation with Burnett by saying you know I'm a Canadian boy and I like the cold weather it'll be good to have my boys grow up where they can play a lot of hockey. Toronto is a fine hockey team and I'm sure this will work out the best for all concerned, I think, I will be in Toronto for a very long time. Next, we have the Philadelphia perspective, and that's from Bruce Caden of the Inquirer. And he writes, the Flyers, preempting their present in favor of their future, traded goalie Bernie Perrant to the Toronto Maple Leafs on Sunday for explosive but troubled center Mike Walton. And then they traded Walton to the Boston Bruins for a pair of untested rookies. Keith Allen, the Flyers general manager, told Keaton, a deal like this required a lot of soul searching by our whole organization, but I knew for a long time that in order for our team to make any real advancement in the future, in other words, to compete for the Stanley Cup, we would have to think in terms of trading away a goalie. We're not worried about the Bruins, said Marcel Pelletier, Flyers director of player personnel. They'll beat somebody else that we need to beat for us. While the key figure for the Flyers in the Toronto end of the deal was that first round draft pick, Rick McLeish apparently was the joker in the prearranged shuffling of the deck. The 5 foot 10 inch, 180 pound youngster was the number four amateur pick in the NHL draft last June. This season, McLeish, who scored 119 goals in three years in the OHA Junior A League. Uh, this year, McLeish has netted 15 goals as a rookie pro down at Oklahoma City. That total indicates two recent uh, three-goal hat tricks in his last few games, so the kid has actually been heating up as he gets used to the pro game. Danny Schock, the other part of the deal, and he plays all three forward positions, and he made the Bruin roster this season, but he really didn't see much ice time, so he was uh, traded to Philadelphia, and he played two games for the Flyers before being shipped out to the American Hockey League Quebec Aces uh, for a two-week conditioning stint. 
Keaton did manage to reach Perrant at his home in Cherry Hill, New Jersey by telephone, but Bernie said, I just don't want to talk about it now. I don't mean to be miserable, but I'm a little shook up by everything at the moment. Keaton also contacted Bruce Gamble in Toronto, and he said he was very sorry to be leaving the Ontario city. It's the only place, Bruce says, I've had a chance to hang my hat and really call home. I was called up for two weeks and I stayed for four years. When the Maple Leafs announced the deal on Sunday evening, a Toronto general manager, Jim Gregory, had no idea that Walton wouldn't be staying with the Flyers. He told the Globe and Mail that he knew there was a possibility that at some point Mike would be involved in a second transaction, but he felt that that might take, take a while to arrange. So he expressed some surprise that uh, Walton's deal to Boston was immediately announced by the Flyers. He had no idea that the Bruins and the Flyers had prearranged to acquire him, uh, that the Bruins had prearranged to acquire Mike, and, and he sounded genuinely surprised by that. Gregory also said that Perrant would be given a few days to get his family up to Toronto and that he would be in goal for the Maple Leafs, certainly next weekend if not before. Now this deal should be attractive for Perrant simply because he's always idolized Jacques Plante, who's now a Maple Leaf of course, and the chance to learn from the future Hall of Famer up close could improve Bernie's game immensely. Don't forget the Leafs already have Johnny Bauer on hand and few know the goaltending craft better than Plant and Bauer together. Bernie told other Toronto writers later in the week when Ernie Wakely went to St. Louis he was just another goalkeeper. After working with Plant for a season he became a Western Division All-Star goalie. I'll take everything Plant tells me you better believe it. Next season I figure I could be the East goalie in the NHL All-Star game. Plant said he needs to work on his play with the goal stick and Plant is fantastic at fielding and passing pucks as everybody knows. Bernie also said that Johnny Bauer has the greatest poke check that any goalie ever had and he hopes that he can learn that from Bauer as well. Bernie says, I intend to listen and I know they'll teach me. Both are great with young goaltenders. This is a big break for me. Walton, who up until Sunday evening had been described as too ill to even think about playing hockey, has suddenly been cured of whatever ailed him. He wanted to play in the very next Boston game, which was scheduled for Wednesday evening. Walton was asked about playing for the Bruins, who seemingly have little room at center for uh, ice time for Mike. They've got Phil Esposito, Fred Stanfield, and Derek Sanderson ahead of him on their depth chart. Mike claims to have no preference on where he lines up in Boston, just as long as it's on the ice somewhere in the Bruins scheme of things. That wasn't the only big deal announced at the beginning of this very eventful week. On Monday afternoon, the Red Wings and Rangers were at it again with another major trade. The Rangers acquired forward Bruce McGregor and defenseman Larry Brown from the Red Wings in exchange for defenseman Arnie Brown and Mike Robitaille and a young forward by the name of Tom Miller who was playing for the Omaha Knights of the Central Hockey League and it was the second Rangers second major trade in six days you remember that they had swapped young Silaps to Pittsburgh for Glenn Sather last week and we had told you about trade rumors involving Arnie Brown to Minnesota last week as well. Now if Larry Brown sounds familiar you remember he's he's 23 years old by the way uh, he was originally a Ranger and was traded to Detroit on October 31st for Peter Stemkowski. Uh, Larry Brown had two goals and four assists in 37 games this season. Arnie Brown is 29 in his seventh season with the Rangers and has collected three goals, 12 assists in 48 games. He originally came to the Rangers in a major trade with the Maple Leafs in February of 1964 that saw Don McKenney and Andy Bathgate end up in Toronto, who used those two players to win a Stanley Cup. 
Mike Robitaille is 23. He appeared in only 11 games for the Rangers. He had a goal and an assist. Tom Miller is also 23. He's in his second pro year. And he had 17 goals, 29 assists in 44 games for Omaha. The general feeling around uh, hockey was that uh, this this trade made sense for the Rangers. They're attempting to improve on a club in an effort to avoid the collapse uh, last season that saw them slide from first to fourth. This is a different Ranger team. I don't think there was the danger of them sliding down, as Stan Fischler wrote. Uh, where I think this comes from is trying to close the gap between the Bruins and the Rangers. The Rangers can see that they're just lacking something that Bruins have that will always keep them ahead of them. And this deal is part of the Emil Francis plan to close that gap. Now, a hitch in the deal developed almost immediately when Bruce McGregor threatened to refuse to report to the Rangers. And here is how the New York Times reported on this. Coach Emil Francis telephoned Arnie Brown yesterday and before the, before the coach could say hello, Brown asked him, okay, which team did you trade me to? The Rangers thus completed their second big deal in a week as they sent Brown, defenseman Mike Robitaille, and uh, forward Tom Miller to the Red Wings in exchange for Bruce McGregor, a forward, and Larry Brown, a defenseman. The deal had bizarre overtones. Last third October 31st, the Rangers had traded Larry Brown to the Wings along with young center Don Luce for Pete Stemkowski. At that time, Stemkowski immediately balked at reporting to New York, claiming he wasn't sure he wanted to play in the big city. But he did subsequently join the team. Now, as soon as Sunday or Monday's deal was completed, or supposedly completed, McGregor told the Associated Press in Detroit, I haven't made a decision yet whether I want to report to New York. McGregor told the AP, I'm going to take a few days to think about it I think they'll probably, that is the Rangers, will probably suspend me. And he was right. Arnie Brown's reaction to the trade, he, he was upset about it, we understand. But he was philosophical in what he told Gerald Eskenazi of the Times. Brown, uh, Brownie said he couldn't say that he was at all surprised. Look around the averages around the league. You don't find too many players who stick around on one team for seven years. Brown said, you always knew that it's an inevitability that you're going to be moved. Uh, Brownie said, the thing I regret more than the hockey is having the friends. Hockey you still have ahead of you, the friends you have to leave behind, and that is hard. Brown can read the papers like anybody else. He he knew, he told uh, Eskenazi that he knew a trade was brewing. The rumors were flying all over the place. And he said that when Francis called him, he knew what it was about. And what it's about is that the Red Wings still haven't solved the problem on defense. And defense is a Rangers strong suit with more good players on the farm clubs ready to come out. The Red Wings, in fact, have been again using Gordie Howe as a rear guard in order to bolster the club. Well, I don't know really if that's the reason for it. There are other things going on in Detroit. In Arnie Brown, the Red Wings acquire a proven big leaguer, and in Robitaille, they get a uh, rookie defenseman with a really good slap shot. Miller, as we mentioned, he's a promising young center, but he's playing in the Central League, but he has an NHL future, most observers feel. But Miller's problem was the same problem that faced young Sil Apps, who was traded to Pittsburgh, as we mentioned. The Rangers are deep at center. They have too much depth. These players who are at center are not long in the tooth, so a young center doesn't have a chance in New York in the foreseeable future. The Rangers could afford to give him up to get the players they wanted in Brown and McGregor. McGregor, by the way, is an established player in his own right. He's 29 years old, plays mainly right wing, but the Red Wings this season had been using him a lot at center. 
and this year seems to be an off year for him. Uh, probably a combination of all the upheaval in Detroit, the goofiness of uh, Harkness's coaching, and the fact that Bruce was being forced to play center instead of his usual right wing. He'd scored only six goals and had 16 assists for 22 points in the 47 games he's played this year. He is a dependable sort, though. He shows up every game. He rarely takes a night off. He is in his 11th season with the Red Wings, and he told a friend that he was concerned about his family in being uprooting them after all the time in Detroit. They they live in Windsor, actually, for the winters, and now they're going to have to move to the big city of New York. Bruce was worried about that, and that's why he was balking initially at going to New York. Red Wings coach Doug Barkley sounded really happy with the deal, and here's what he told Jack Berry of the Detroit Free Press. We think we are accomplishing our goal. We're giving our fans interesting, exciting hockey and building for the future of the Red Wings at the same time. Barkley said that they traded for two things they felt they needed, youth and defensemen. Arnie Brown, Barkley says, is an established defenseman who was playing regularly and playing well for New York. Well, Doug, I think if you read the New York papers, you would say that uh, Brown was getting a lot of recent criticism from hockey writers around New York City. Uh, Barkley also said Robitaille is just a young guy who's been the number five defenseman in New York. We don't feel the trade will hurt our lines at all because center has been our strongest position. Bruce has played well, but we felt with guys like Gary Unger and Rennie LeClaire at center, we could make this trade. And our old reliable for all things Detroit, Jack Dolmage, the sports editor of the Windsor Star, uh, gave us his take on the deal and he also contacted Ned Harkness and got uh, a little bit of perspective from Ned. Jack writes that certain hockey players are always going to be traded uh, in the coffee shops that is. Back in those days we didn't really have a lot of Tim Hortons to talk about but around Windsor there are a lot of coffee shops and the fans would gather in the mornings to talk puck just about anywhere you would go. Bruce McGregor of Windsor, 10 years with the Detroit Red Wings, is one of those guys that was always rumored to be traded, but never did get moved. Bruce is a guy who doesn't make a lot of points, but he is a high-class athlete. Dolmage wrote that whatever he had, Bruce gave it all every minute. His dedication and behavior set splendid examples. If he could score, he'd win the Lady Bing Trophy every single season. In the coffee shops, they all often wondered who the Red Wings could get for McGregor. Now they know an experienced, highly rated New York defenseman by the name of Arnie Brown. Ned Harkness told Dolmage that Brown is among the top six defensemen in the National Hockey League. Maybe in the top dozen, says Dalmage, and I think that's closer to it. Ned Harkness's strong suit is not evaluating uh, National Hockey League players as we would come to see in the coming years. Harkness told Dalmage that he hated to let McGregor go, but he also said that about Frank Mahovlich and Bobby Bond, too. Harkness is not long on sentiment, however, much his predecessor, Sid Abel, may have been. Harkness also said... The Red Wings had a three-cornered, complicated deal brewing with both the Rangers and the Flyers, but he couldn't work it out. We wanted an experienced goalie, said Harkness. We're still looking, but it's tough. There don't seem to be any goalkeepers available. We know that the goalkeeper Harkness wanted was the Flyers' Doug Favell. Harkness and Jim Bishop, the Red Wings uh, executive who seems to have the ear of owner Bruce Norris, both know Favell from the lacrosse days and they wanted to bring Doug to Detroit and build their team around him. McGregor, as we mentioned, reluctant to go to New York, talked to Emil Francis and informed him, at like the gentleman he is, that he was having second thoughts about going to New York. He told Francis he would not play in a Wednesday game in Chicago uh, that the Rangers had and that he would talk to Francis on Thursday when New York traveled to Detroit. Francis told McGregor he would be suspended because he wasn't playing in Chicago 
Uh, but he said this is standard procedure and they could probably work things out. Now, Arnie Brown had also expressed similar frustration, but uh, he uh, decided that he liked his paychecks regular, and so he was going to report to Detroit. There was uh, nothing to worry about. McGregor and Francis talked on Thursday. Bruce uh, apparently was convinced that New York would be a good place not only to play hockey, but to raise a family, and he agreed to report to the Rangers. Like so many of the hockey trades that were taking place at this time, and maybe we're just getting better reporting, I don't know, there were underlying factors to this trade. They weren't really mentioned at the time, but nonetheless, they were there below the surface. It was uh, talked about in Detroit that this deal was a result of the Red Wings' Ned Harkness engaging in what was basically union busting. Jack Barry of the Detroit Free Press expanded on this. Barry flat out asked Bruce McGregor if he was traded uh, because uh, he was a Red Wings player representative. McGregor said, I'd really hate to speculate, to speculate on that. Bruce said, I would hope that wouldn't have anything to do with it. But Frank Mahovlich and I were the ones who brought Eagleson in that Sunday when the Red Wings were going to revolt against Harkness as coach. And now, Bruce says, we're both gone. McGregor said of that Sunday incident that it was the sentiment of the entire team to ask the advice of Eagleson, the Toronto attorney, who is the executive director of the Players Association, during the front office turmoil that shook up the Red Wings in January. When Sid Abel resigned as general manager, the players decided to contact Eagleson, and he had several talks, both with the players and club owner Jim Norris, and the Red Wings executive director, Jim Bishop, over a span of about five days and you will remember a few years ago when there was turmoil in the American Hockey League Springfield Indians with the players and owner Eddie Shore who became involved to settle that difference that was the start of Alan Eagleson's journey in professional hockey well Eagleson's talks with the Red Wing management finally resulted in the promotion of Doug Barkley from Fort Worth of the Central League to the Red Wings coaching job first on an interim basis and then permanently what no one at least the players didn't seem to realize maybe Eagleson knew but he didn't tell them was that Harkness was being booted upstairs to take Abel's place. That would give him even more control over the players' futures, and that was something if the players had known, I don't think they would have agreed to. And now we see just exactly what happened with Harkness being booted upstairs with his buddy Jim Bishop. Harkness trades Frank Mahovlich away. He was one that had Eagleson come in, and now he's traded Bruce McGregor away. Can Gary Unger be far behind in any event the story didn't seem to have legs it didn't appear anywhere around the national hockey league and probably for good reason the nhl writers and the the nhl players well not players so much as managers and coaches don't like to rock the boat they don't want these kind of stories taking away from what they say is the product on the ice so around the league other than detroit this was the only place that mentions of union busting or being traded for player uh, association activities would take place. But it didn't stay dead for long because by the end of the weekend, the next big trade took place. On Saturday, the Red Wings again were involved in a blockbuster deal. This time, Ned Harkness hooked up with the St. Louis Blues general manager, Scotty Bowman. And this was a really, really major transaction that might affect both franchises for many years to come. We'll let Wally Cross of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch break the news in his own way, as he did Saturday afternoon. The bombshell that Scotty Bowman has been promising for more than three weeks 
exploded on the Blues on Saturday. Bowman, general manager of Sidney Solomon Jr.'s National Hockey League entry, traded Red Berenson, his genuine scoring star, and young forward Tim Ecclestone to the Detroit Red Wings for center Gary Unger and right winger Wayne Connolly. The deal was to take effect immediately with Unger and Connolly joining the Blues in Philadelphia for their nationally televised contest on Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock against the Philadelphia Flyers. The key to the trade, of course, is Unger, who is considered by Bowman to be one of the top three centers in the entire National Hockey League. Bowman said, I don't think the opportunity to get someone you can build a club around comes along very often. So yes, you have to grab it when you can, and Scotty certainly did. Bowman said that even as late as last week, Unger was a Detroit untouchable. Bowman said that a lot of clubs had tried to get him, but the Wings simply wouldn't let Gary go. Bowman went on to say that by the same token, he would never have considered trading the the Blues for superstar Red Berenson until Unger's name actually came up. You just couldn't get the value back for anybody else but Unger, and that's why the deal was made. Ironically, of course, of course both Unger and Berenson are having down seasons in the 70-71 campaign. It seemed that right from the start of training camp, Unger had clashed with Harkness, who was then the coach and later became the general manager of the Red Wings, over the subject of his long hair. And there were several other confrontations that followed, with the result that Unger's production is far beneath that of his previous seasons. In 51 games this year, Unger had tallied 13 goals, 14 assists for 27 points. Berenson, who's 31, had been the Blues' premier offensive player since his acquisition from the New York Rangers in November of 1967. Yes, he didn't originally start with the Blues. He was actually traded there in a deal for the Blues' Ron Stewart early in that first expansion season. Berenson holds the club record for most goals and points in one season, most goals, assists, and points in one game, and the most playoff goals in the team's history. However, the Red Baron has also had trouble around the net this season, something Bowman hints may be due to his involvement as president of the National Hockey League Players Association. Berenson this year has netted 16 goals and added 26 assists to show for 45 games. It's hard to trade a player like Berenson who has done so much for this team, said Bowman. He went on to say that sometimes you have to take an impersonal approach to moves like this. He was paid well and he performed well. Berenson said that an originally proposed by Detroit deal of, or by the Blues of Berenson or up for Unger had been completely out of a question because it was too much of an age difference there. But sometimes you just have to take an impersonal touch, like he said, and so we did have to give some youth back to Detroit, and that's why Ecclestone and Connolly were involved, they balanced out the age difference in the players that were moving. Harkness of Detroit obviously felt that Ecclestone could be the key to the deal for them. He's only 23 years old. He plays right wing, but he can also line up at center, and he's been used on the left side as well. Uh, Detroit uh, had to get youth back, and Ecclestone was the best young player that the Blues actually had. And this year, he seemed to finally begin to coming uh, coming into his own. The goal he scored on Saturday at the arena in Pittsburgh was his 15th of the year, one less than he got in 65 games the previous season. So he was starting to put the puck in the net as well. And what it bre- breaks down to is that uh, the Blues are trading 23 and 31 year old player for a 23 and 31 year old player. Bowman said he would not have traded Berenson even up for Phil Esposito last season. That's how much he meant to the Blues. But the last time I looked, Scott, he says, there were 16 centers in the league with more points than Red Berenson. And that doesn't take into account the plus minus figures which Scotty is very high on. Bowman was asked straight out 
if Berenson's activities in the National Hockey League Players Association were a factor in the trade or affected his play, and he neatly sidestepped that question. But he did say, I know that clubs have felt that players like Norm Ullman and Ted Lindsay lost something when they were president of that association. Now add this to the mix. Why did Ecclestone get included in the deal? Last week, he was elected the Blues player representative, so yet another player representative is on the move. This sounds almost like the late 50s when Ted Lindsay was traded because of his work trying to form a players union. Nobody's talking about it, but you just can't change the facts. Now, as it turns out, there were other underlying facts, like there are so often, like we spoke about earlier in this broadcast, that may have affected this particular trade. They didn't surface immediately, but in the coming days, there's a story that will come out that will really kind of make you look again at how the Blues were doing things. Maybe Sid Solomon was not the great owner uh, the benefactor that all the players thought he was. You're going to find out a little something that took place, and we'll keep that as kind of a teaser till we finally come up, uh, get the full details, which will come out in the coming weeks, about why Red Berenson may actually have been dealt from the Blues. Although I will say this, in a heartbeat, Red Berenson for Gary Unger, even giving up Ecclestone, was a good deal. Although I, I'm sure the Red Wings would come to think that that wasn't the case years down the road. We have one other quick story we want to bring you this busy week. And that's the unfortunate injury suffered by Montreal defenseman Serge Savard. Montreal Gazette's Ian McDonald gives us a report. He wrote that depressed and uncertain about his very hockey future, Canadian Serge Savard lies in a Montreal hospital on Monday morning with his fractured left leg in a cast. Full extent of the damage won't be known until further study of the x-rays is made, but it appears now that Serge has suffered a fracture without displacement of the same bone in his left leg which was shattered in five places last March 11th. He is lost from hockey indefinitely. Serge told McDonald it was one of those things an accident about the collision with Bobby Bond in the first period of uh, the Saturday night game between the Leafs and Canadians at the Forum in Montreal. Savard said, I thought he was going to gonna miss me. I don't know now. I just don't know how bad this is. For a couple of hours Saturday, Savard thought definitely that the ball game for him at least was over. Following the collision with the sturdy Bond, Savard regained his feet, went after the puck behind the net. He started a rush, but then he felt something funny in the leg. He headed immediately for the bench. He knew something was wrong. The Canadian's young new trainer, Phil Langlois, was the first to talk to Savard, who told him, It's my leg. I can't walk. A few minutes later, preliminary diagnosis indicated the worst. Angry swelling around the screws, which had helped mend the multiple breaks last year, suggested that the damage was of equal severity and it had been inflicted once again on poor young Savard. There were tears of frustration in his eyes as teammates wished him well after the first period while he was being prepared for an ambulance ride to a local hospital. Savard knew instinctively that the leg was broken. He was despondent. His wife was watching the game on television at home, rushed to the hospital, and she told friends that Serge appeared immensely relieved when the scrutiny of the films indicated the injury was not as severe and there was reason to hope that he might be able to start another comeback maybe next season. The cast was put on at 10.30 p.m. on Saturday night, and on Sunday night, Savard continued to be really down in the dumps, and who could blame him? Montreal's team physician, Dr. Douglas Kinnear, said that the clean break is virtually in the same place where two pins were inserted in the leg back 
in March when the original break happened. So Serge Savard out for the rest of this season. Let's hope he can uh, make a recovery at least well enough to gain a spot again in the National Hockey League. The kid had a bright future, but this puts it definitely in doubt. So that is our show this week, and what did we learn from this very eventful week? Well, we learned that patience is a virtue, at least in making hockey trades. The Maple Leafs took their time to trade Mike Walton, and they got exactly what they wanted in goalie Bernie Perrant. We learned that being close to the first place Bruins isn't close enough for Emil Francis, and he pulled off yet another deal to try and close the gap between the Bruins and the Rangers. And we learned you better not get on the wrong side of some National Hockey League GMs, no matter what star status you think you have, or you'll find yourself on the move to another team. As we learned again this week, anybody can be traded. We'll have lots more for you next week as usual and here are some of the stories we're working on. Scotty Bowman is going to make a coaching change in St. Louis right after their blockbuster trade. I thought Al Arbor was doing a pretty good uh, job. We'll find out who's going to replace him. We will meet an Ontario Hockey Association Junior A star who will definitely be one of the top choices in the 1971 amateur draft. And we will get that interesting theory or story, whatever you want to call it, on why the Blues really traded uh, Red Berenson. There were a couple of stories that have strong basis in fact as to why Scotty Bowman dealt the first superstar for any of the 67 expansion teams. And we will have much, much more. The 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast is produced by Andy Cole. I can't thank Andy enough as I say every week. It's because he deserves it. He puts a lot of work into this thing and the results we think uh, show just how good he is at this. He's in the business of producing podcasts as well now. And if you have an idea for a podcast, contact me. I'll hook you up with Andy and maybe you guys can put something together. The very popular Juno-nominated indie rock group from Toronto, the Rural Alberta Advantage, provides our intro and exit music. If you ever get a chance to see them live when things open up again, don't miss any of their shows. You'll have a great time. Other musical pieces and sound effects in the podcast are produced by Andy Cole as well. Our research comes from files of the Toronto Star, the Toronto Globe and Mail, and of course, the many fine publications found at newspapers.com. You can find us on Twitter at at Hockey50Years, on Facebook under 50 Years Ago in Hockey, and we have a WordPress site, Hockey50YearsAgo.com. And of course, you can get this podcast wherever you download your favorite podcast apps. Don't forget our Patreon account. Subscribing to Patreon gets you early access and some great bonus content. Uh, this 7071 season is uh, shaping up to be one of the most interesting ever, and we'll be with you all the way. And on that note, we will see you next time. When-